Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on where you're joining in. Uh, this is Maurizio De Pita from the Basque Center of Applied Mathematics here in Bilbao, Spain. We have a beautiful day down here today, and uh, I am one of the organizers of this fantastic workshop I'm very glad to introduce you to. Uh, I'm joining in right now by the other two uh, uh, co-organizers uh, that I would present. One is presenting right now in the form of a blank screen. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's evil. I don't know if uh, if he's around. The other one is uh, Tang Shin Kao from the University of Melbourne. Um, and uh, one second that I'll see if Ivo is, is also able to join. Ivo, we don't see you. Um, I see myself. We can't even barely see you okay well i'm there <laughs> you can you confirm please that you're there vj can see me yeah i can see you okay so it's only me that i can see okay so that's good uh, so let me see if i can see so i i don't see him but i guess uh, before i i uh, i leave him the uh the, the pleasure to introduce the first speaker of today um, I would like to thank again all the organizers of the main meeting who, and uh, Ankur, C, Ankur uh, uh, as well as the other uh, organizers of the online platform for this uh, painstaking process of uh, uh, taking effort and care to follow us up in the setting up of this uh, amazing effort that is coming up uh, with and as well as the 22 speakers of this uh, workshop that we are about to start that over the past months agreed uh, to give their uh, great contribution that we are all looking forward to. So without further hesitation, I will leave the, the, the stage to Ivo Sigman from uh, John Moore Liverpool University in the UK, who is uh, going to chair the first two uh, uh, talks of today's uh, First session. Ivo, please uh, go on. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Ivo Siegmann from Liverpool John Moores University. I'm a senior lecturer of applied mathematics there. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Vijay Rajagopal. I think it's more than 10 years ago that I met Vijay at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. It was one of my first days there, and I met him when I went up to level six with a lift. Vijay got his PhD from the Auckland Bioengineering Institute at the University of Auckland in New Zealand in 2006. After his PhD, he stayed in Auckland for a few years. In this time, he won the Early Career Researcher Grant from the Royal Society in New Zealand. He then moved to Singapore as a research scientist with, uh, in the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology before joining the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of uh, Melbourne in Australia in 2014. Currently, his uh, senior lecturer there. So uh, please join me in welcoming Vijay, and I look forward uh, to his talk. Thank you very much, Eva, for your kind introduction. And hello to everyone from my uh, four-year-old daughter's bedroom. This is not my bedroom. Um, I want to uh, thank, first of all, the organizers of this uh, workshop, uh, Ping Jing, Maurizio, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and Ivo, uh, for uh, inviting me to part participate in this very interesting workshop. Uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, my presentation today. Uh, so yes, my name is Vijay Rajagopal. I'm a, a senior lecturer and faculty member at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. And uh, today what I want to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing in studying calcium, si calcium signaling in the heart and how structural remodeling of the heart affects uh, calcium signaling. Uh, but because of, the, um, uh, because, because of thinking about the audience uh, in, in the workshop, I thought I'd give, it, uh, give the talk more of a bend on or a focus or emphasis on the engineering or technological challenges in studying uh, calcium signaling and structural remodeling, as opposed to uh, more of the biology of cardiac cell remodeling. 
Uh, but I, I'd be very uh, interested to, to talk about those things as well um, uh, after this talk, if you're interested. So um, let me start by uh, first acknowledging or thanking all, uh, um, the PhD students and postdocs who've uh, been involved in uh, developing uh, the work that I'm going to present today. Uh, you'll also be hearing from Agna uh, in the next talk, uh, um, uh, where she'll be talking about some of the work uh, we did together on hypertrophic calcium signaling as well. Um, right, so uh, before I begin getting into the, um, the nitty gritty of this uh, presentation, uh, let me just start by introducing, for those who are not familiar with cardiac cell physiology, um, how calcium signaling uh, affects um, how the heart functions. So every, every time the heart, uh, your heart beats, there's an electrical wave that goes over your um, uh, over your, uh, the heart tissue and excites the uh, um, uh, cell membrane of uh, all the cardiomyocytes that make up the heart. And um, there are these uh, invaginations of the cell membrane called T-tubules, which, uh, are, which have these voltage-gated ion channels called L-type calcium channels uh, embedded within them. And what happens when the uh, electrical activation comes down the T-tubule is that it activates the gate of ion channels and allows for a small amount of calcium to be released from the extracellular space into the intracellular space. And the space it enters is a very narrow space, about 15 nanometers in, in diameter, and it's, and, which, and it's called, a, uh, is the, and it's called the uh, dyadic cleft. And in this dyadic cleft are another set of ion channels called Ryandi receptors, shown in this purple or pink uh, color. And uh, these Ryanity receptors sense that increased calcium and then release a large flux of calcium from the uh, internal calcium store called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And once the ca it, this extra flux of calcium binds to actin, it allows for actin and myosin to, uh, to, to, to uh, in interact with each other, and then we have uh, the, uh, the heart contract. And the relaxation phase of this involves another set of ion channels which again take the, the calcium away from the cytoplasm back into the uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum stores uh, and some also go through the calcium ATPase uh, out into the extracellular space. So this is what I've just shown you in a, in a sketched or a cartoon diagram is effectively the, uh, 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 the regular beat-to-beat -beat variation in calcium dynamics in cardiac cells that is important for the heart to beat. And uh, these uh, images on the left here are three uh, are sort of uh, you know uh, this is a three dimensional view of the of the same cartoon that I showed before. Um, these are some super resolution images of the actin in red and these Ryanian receptors inside the dyadic cliffs in green. Um, and you have these electron microscopy images showing you actin and uh, actin and myosin as well as mitochondria that are all tightly packed together. And uh, what's important is that the spatial arrangement of those L-type channels, the Ryanity receptors, the calcium reuptake proteins, the spatial arrangement of all of these proteins is very important because, uh, uh, because without, that, uh, without appropriate uh, arrangement, what happens is that the synchronous uh, activation of the heart, uh, the heartbeat is, is lost. Um, and what you might, what you may get, are these very, uh, you know, uncoordinated uh, um, release of calcium that then uh, may cause arrhythmia and so on and so forth. Now, un underlying, uh, uh, now the 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 thing about uh, uh, about the structural uh, um, organization of these proteins is that in a healthy heart, it's reasonably robust, but in uh, disease conditions like heart failure these uh, organizations start to lose their integrity. So on the right-hand image, you can see the top row is a low magnification and a high magnification view of those invaginations or T-tubules that I mentioned. And um, uh, these are in control in the top row. And in the bottom row are uh, or images of the set of the T-tubules in a disease condition. So when, these, when uh, this sort of uh, disorganization occurs, ion channel distributions are affected, calcium release is affected, um, the heart can undergo uh, arrhythmic or asynchronous uh, um, uh, myocyte contractions. 
So we're really interested in understanding how structure, how sensitive uh, the heart is to the structural remodeling in the, uh, of the cells and how structural remodeling may actually feed to downstream effects uh, on uh, on the heartbeat because um, what, uh, what what's uh, in, uh, important to understand is that calcium is not only involved in the beat to beat uh, uh, contraction and relaxation cycle calcium is also involved in remodeling processes within the heart so it can, it can actually have a sort of a vicious cycle uh, when you have structural remodeling that affects calcium which could then affect uh, further remodeling of the heart so in terms of uh, uh, our research, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the big challenges in trying to understand how structural remodeling affects the heart is that um, uh, the data sets that people work with are quite varied and of, of different resolutions and are of different modalities. For instance, uh, someone may uh, look at uh, an electron microscope image to visualize the organization of the structure of the cell, of the subcellular architecture but then when they're doing uh, imaging of uh, function they'll use these uh, ca calcium imaging uh, techniques like uh, confocal line scans which uh, are at a much higher uh, or much lower resolution and much larger field of view um, the other challenge is that when collecting these types of data no single image uh, has all of the information so if you want to study what is the effect of some structural remodeling you're seeing on, in one cell, on one image, um, what effect it has on function, it's really hard to pin, pin it down uh, w w within the same cell. And so what, uh, one, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, things that we've been working on for the last uh, you know, few years is really to overcome this technological challenge with uh, engineering solutions. Um, and uh, what we've done is developed a computational modeling framework in w which allows us to integrate these different types of data and, uh, and it allows us to predict the integrated rep response of the cell when changes to the structure are implemented in the model. And our vision is that this sort of technique, uh, this, this framework, as we extend it and make it, more, uh, uh, make it have more bells and whistles, uh, we'll be able to uh, apply it for drug screening applications. For instance, when you see a response in, uh, to a drug in a confocal image scan, what we would like to be able to do, to do is show what may happen to the, structural, uh, uh, to the structure of the cell from that, dr from that uh, drug treatment. Or vice versa, if you see some image that you, uh, of a, under a microscope of uh, of the response of the heart to some uh, disease, uh, to some disease or some treatment, we would like to be able to predict what happens to the heart, uh, what's happening functionally from those structural images. So, and uh, what I'm going to uh, do for the remainder of this talk is just uh, go over very briefly how we've set up this modeling framework so far and where we're headed. Um, so, uh, in uh, one of the uh, so what I've listed out here is are some of the aims, uh, the major aims that we have or goals that we have in uh, developing this uh, computational modeling framework. The first thing we want to be able to do is we want to be able to capture the variability in structure that you see in different uh, microscope images. So just as I said that, you know, uh, no one single image can't have everything. Um, when you take some images of heart cells uh, under the microscope, they all have a variation in their structure, or uh, not, not only across experimental groups, also within a tissue block as well. So we want to be able to uh, build, uh, build this variability into our modeling framework. Uh, a second thing we uh, want to do is be able to plug and play different types of organization of key uh, components of the calcium signaling uh, process. So, uh, the, you know, for example, we want to we want to see how uh, how calcium signaling may, signaling may be affected when you change properties of the myofibrils, which are the contracting filaments in the heart in, uh, in the cardiac cell. Uh, what might happen when mitochondria are in the model or not, because mitochondria are also regulated by calcium, um, and, and also mitochondria affect contraction. Uh, and also, uh, we want to be able to plug and play these different uh, ion channels. How, whether knocking, uh, you know, that, that way we can study what happens when you 
knock something in or out, or you could change the distribution to reflect a disease condition to see what effect that might have on the uh, on the um, on the calcium signaling system. Uh, finally, uh, another design goal we have is to really do integrated uh, 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 integrated simulations. Uh, we don't want to just focus on calcium signaling uh, because in the end, the heart is a contracting uh, organ. Its function, main function is to contract and to generate the heartbeat. And the mechanics uh, plays as, as critical a role as calcium dynamics. And they both drive each other in a way. So we want to have an integrated uh, simulation framework where you can study calcium dynamics, mechanics, and energetics within this um, cell structure. So, uh, so, so uh, the, the first thing that we tackled was, uh, was actually to be able to integrate different um, microscopy images to build 3D models. This is one of the first things that we conducted back in 2015 in our paper in PLOS Computational Biology. And, um, you know, uh, the, we were one of the first people to show how you can uh, take uh, uh, electron microscopy images at 35 or 30 nanometer resolution um, and fuse it with um, uh, confocal images of uh, calcium release proteins, in this case, branding receptors, through using computational mathematical modeling techniques. Um, at that time, certainly when we, were, when we published this work, uh, correlated element uh, light microscopy and electron microscopy was still in its infancy, and to a certain extent, it still is in its infancy. And so, uh, we found this computational approach a really clever way to, uh, a really nice way to integrate um, data sets into one unified model. And the essence of this technique is really to uh, look at the distribution of the uh, ion channels of interest that release calcium with respect to other organelles that you will find in your uh, other image modality. So here we've stained for rinding receptors in green and uh, myofibrils in red. Um, and then we extract the cloud of points representing the rinding receptors um, and then measure their, uh, their spatial distribution with respect to each other and also with respect to key organelle components like Z-discs and myofibrils. And this spatial distribution uh, that we collect over uh, uh, you know, several tissue blocks uh, and several cells uh, can then be used to inform a uh, spatial statistics uh, model that simulates rinding receptor distributions. So we can fit uh, uh, what you see in this image on the bottom here, uh, the red dots are um, basically simulated rinding receptor points on a uh, electron tomogram that we've uh, that we've also collected. So the red dots are simulated uh, uh, synthetic rinding receptor points that reflect the uh, anatomical uh, positioning of rinding receptors uh, that we've basically generated by fusing the two different data sets together. And uh, once we have this uh, integrated model, taking these two types of data together, we can then start to simulate um, calcium dynamics. So we've been doing a lot of uh, you know different types of modeling, deterministic, um, uh, you know, uh, deterministic approximation to the Markov uh, to the uh, to uh, Markov, Markov state two-state Markov models. That's something that uh, Evo and I collaborated with a long time ago, um, and also more recently we've been also looking at stochastic uh, modeling as well. And what we are able to show with these models is how um, um, how sharp gradients in calcium uh, dynamics are formed inside this uh, he highly heterogeneous uh, distribution of um, um, cell arc cell components um, uh, uh, in cardiomyocytes. Now, uh, so that so hopefully, uh, uh, you know, if if this is something of interest to people in in the neuroscience community as well, I'd be very interested to uh, talk to you about that. How uh, because uh, these techniques that we've developed are quite transferable to other uh, biological cell systems as well. Um, it's, uh, 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 but we've, we've come from a, a cardiomyocyte angle uh, based on the background of our, uh, you know, background motivation uh, on where, where we started. Um, so uh, we have studied uh, using this model how structural remodeling in disease conditions affects the calcium signaling 
But as I mentioned, I wanted to just focus more on the technical aspect of the engineering challenges today with you. Um, so I wanted to just show you something, something else that we worked on uh, in line with this uh, uh, developing this uh, computational modeling framework. So uh, recently, there was a paper in eLife that showed how um, that, that showed uh, uh, a technique uh, where you use astronomical um, image processing techniques to try to extract the distribution of these Ryanine receptors from live microscopy data. Uh, if you think about the previous work that I'd shown, the, the work that I've shown you just before, we start with uh, images of heart cell structure that are from fixed images. So these are cells that are not alive anymore. And then we simulate calcium dynamics and validate the model against some live confocal imaging. In this method, this new method that they presented, uh, they wanted to extract the distribution of Ryanine receptors straight out of live imaging data. So this sounded like a very useful and uh, powerful approach that we wanted to, uh, to use to then basically take live imaging uh, and, and extract structural information directly. Um, and what I'm going to show now is how we actually were able to use the model that we've already built uh, as a, as a, um, as a uh, validation tool to see how this method uh, performs in extracting information about calcium signaling. Uh, so a, a few questions that we had when we looked at this paper is that if you're using when using astronomical image processing techniques, it may not be so uh, uh, so good an idea because uh, you know when you're dealing with astronomy, you're dealing with objects that are really really far you know distant uh, distances apart. But a cardiac cell, or indeed any cell, is a really crowded environment. So how good is this technique going to be? That's one of the questions that we had. Um, and the and we also had the uh, the um, the question that maybe when you change the when when there are changes to the distribution of ion channels or the in the number of them at least even um, that may affect your estimation of the distribution of these uh, of these proteins from live uh, imaging data. So in order to do that uh, to do the study, uh, we extended our uh, the model that I just presented before, and we built up a three dimensional model of the cardiomyocyte. And we also then simulated, uh, using the, the simulation itself, we created these synthetic confocal images of, um, of uh, calcium signaling. So we basically have generated our own synthetic ground tr truth data um, with which we can uh, test different, uh, different scenarios and see how the calcium clean, uh, this new algorithm performs. So here we're showing you uh, images of how calcium clean works. It basically takes the uh, fluorescence images that we've generated and then uh, performs a bit of uh, you know, deconvolution effectively to then uh, extract the, uh, what it thinks are the centroids of calcium release uh, proteins. The green um, circles are our actual positions from our, uh, from our model. And the um, and the circles, whether uh, if they're blue, they represent uh, they represent where the calcium clean algorithm pr predicts the position to be, and um, and if they're blue, then they're um, uh, true positives. If it's red, then it's a false positive. So basically, the algorithm detected it incorrectly, and you can see that while the algorithm the algorithm does predict quite well some of the positions of Ryan receptor clusters, but it doesn't do that great a job. Um, we also wanted to show what wanted to test what happens if you change the number of Ryanine receptors, you know, the density of the Ryanine receptors, keep them far apart versus keep them really close by. And we also wanted to plug and play what happens when you change the mitochondria, uh, whether mitochondria are in there or not. This is because when you're doing confocal imaging, you don't see uh, uh, mitochondria, you just see a flow of calcium. So we just wanted to know how much of the calcium uh, signaling measurements that we see are affected by mitochondrial uh, mitochondria in the in the in the structure? So this is now a cross-sectional view where the top row shows high density Ryanine receptors and low density Ryanine receptors, and the bottom versus the top row is that this top row we've 
effectively said that the mitochondria are obstacles. And in the bottom row, mitochondria are not obstacles. So calcium can freely diffuse through it. Um, obviously, when you change the density of RYR clusters, it's going to affect uh, the calcium that you see at any point in the cell. So in this right-hand view, this uh, plot is just showing you that the calcium that's seen uh, at the Z-disc is uh, affected by Ryanin receptor distribution. We actually then tried to see how calcium clean this new algorithm performs in uh, detecting Ryanin receptor clusters. And what's interesting is that it's the density of the Ryanin receptor clusters that really affects your uh, precision to recall curve, not the pres presence of mitochondria. So the number of calcium release sites affects the accuracy and performance of this uh, interesting new algorithm that's out there. So uh, um, I, I won't, I won't uh, you know, the, you can certainly um, uh, uh, read more about what we've done uh, in terms of the analysis of this work in, um, in our paper in Frontiers in Physiology. Uh, but to summarize, uh, what we learned from this work is that calcium clean, uh, the calcium clean's performance is affected mostly by the Ryanin receptor cluster density. Um, uh, we showed that calcium clean could be used in our model when no, so we could basically incorporate this calcium clean data when low numbers of Ryan, uh, release events are activated. So if we could just uh, have a few sparks releasing, then that's a reasonable place where you can start to analyze, you can accurately pick up where calcium is being released from. Um, and certainly this, this study, what it allowed us to do was to also test our ability to plug and play different structural components uh, within the modeling framework. Um, and uh, what we've also done is provide this uh, modeling framework as a tool to benchmark, uh, not just counts and clean, but any other um, uh, algorithms that may be out there for analyzing, uh, analyzing calcium signaling data. Um, and again, if this is something of interest to people in the computational neuroscience community, uh, please do get in touch with us. Sorry, PJ, you have about uh, one minute left. <laughs> Great, almost done. So um, with that, uh, I'll conclude by, uh, uh, by saying that uh, what we've done so far is demonstrate uh, with our techniques, we've been able to integrate different data and uh, accounting for the variability of the of the of the um, of the uh, components uh, and the, in the in the cell in the experimental data, we're able to do plug and play, and we've also um, you know as as we've shown you here, we're, and we've got a few more papers out now where we show how we can simulate calcium dynamics in the cardiac cell, um, and in our ongoing work, we're uh, wanting to extend what we've done so far to uh, include bioenergetics and mechanics. Um, and uh, if you're, uh, and we're also looking at making our uh, data extraction process more easy by uh, looking at uh, using deep uh, convolutional neural networks along the way as well. Um, and of course, you're gonna hear from Agna about some of the work that we've also done in um, um, cardiac hypertrophy and calcium signal. So um, with that, I want to acknowledge all the um, students that have been involved in this project with us. And uh, of course, my collaborators, uh, Edmund Crampen, Eric Hansen in Australia, uh, Lou Roderick in Belgium, and Christian Soller in Exeter. Thank you, and uh, look forward to your questions. So uh, we have time for just one question from the audience. So uh, Martin Falke asks, so I will read the question in the interest of time. VJ, you said your simulations were able to show the steep concentration gradients arising from calcium dynamics inside the components. Inside which components? Inside diadic clefts or mitochondria? Um, it, around the border of mitochondria and around the di diadic clefts as well. That was a great question. Thanks. Okay, so there's one more question by uh, Carlos Vivarios. Um, so, um, I will ask this question, but then we have to move on to the next talk. Thanks for the talk. Regarding EM, chemical fixation can deform the cellular space. How much of this could impact the output of correlative microscopy? Uh, that's a great question as well. So um, yes, the, there are high, high pressure freezing techniques that we can use to extract more of this data. 
Um, and that's certainly uh, something that we're looking to do more and more in the future. Um, and and uh, you know, there's a paper by a co colleague of ours uh, who's at the University of Freiburg, Freiburg. His name is Peter Cole. He's actually done some analysis on this, the effect of chemical fixation versus high, high pressure freezing on uh, the structure of cells. That, that's worth reading. Thanks a lot, Vijay. I will now invite our next uh, speaker on screen. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> so our next speaker is Agne uh, Tilonaite. Agne got her first degree from the Kaunas Institute of Technology in Lithuania in 2012. She then moved to Nottingham for a master's program and got her first uh, got her PhD with Rüdiger Thul, who we will hear from uh, on our second day of this workshop. After her PhD, Agne left the UK to work as a postdoc with uh, Vijay Rajagopal, who we just heard from in Melbourne. And she then recently moved to Switzerland to work for the Interax Biotech AG as a systems biologist. Um, I'm looking forward to Agnes' talk. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And today I will be talking about uh, inositol triphosphate receptors, uh, activity in cardiomyocytes. sites. Uh, so even though I will be concentrating on cardiomyocytes, uh, hopefully you will find similar terminology and similar calcium signaling pathways in other uh, systems. So hopefully you will find something interesting here. Huh. So let's talk why should we care about uh, cardiac uh, behavior. So in normal years, not 2020, uh, leading causes in death in Australia and in other countries are usually heart related. So uh, on top of is ischemic heart diseases, which was leading causes of death in 2008, 12, 2017. Then we have diabetes, heart failure and cardiac arrhythmic. Furthermore, Australia government spends quite a lot of money on cardiovascular diseases as well. Uh, again, that's based on earlier years and 2020 may be slightly different. Huh. So uh, let's go to the scales of cardiac model. So we can have a whole heart uh, model. Uh, then we can go a little bit lower we have and model cell behavior. Then a little bit lower we will get diet and if we look even deeper we will have sorry Akne, but it seems that we have lost your slides could you try to oh. share them again sure thank you is it okay it's nearly okay we just have to make them full screen again but we can see them again. I don't know what happened, sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's start from the scale of cardiac model and repeat everything. Uh, so we can have a whole heart uh, observations and we can have a mathematical model for a whole heart activity. We can go one level uh, deeper and have cell model. Then we can concentrate on this small bit called diet. And then finally, we can look only at uh, receptor behavior. Uh, here you will see what kind of data we would get in each cases. And let's just say that today I will be concentrating on diet activity, so on this bit. So, as I mentioned, we are interested in diets. So, what is diet? So, it is a place where we have uh, we have uh, L channels that are located on extracellular membrane, 
Uh, from these channels, we have small influx into calcium that reaches uh, IP3 and AYS receptors that are located on sarcoplasmic reticulum. When calcium reaches these receptors, these receptors become activated, they open and they release a high amount of calcium to the, from SR to the cytoplasm. Uh, this leads to calcium concentration increase in cytosol for a brief period of time. Uh, calcium can be returned uh, through circus to sarcoplasmic reticulum and it can bind to buffers. Uh, we also know that in cardiac cells we have both IP3Rs and AYRs. We also know that they are collocated. Uh, however, majority of the models are done on AYR receptors, while IP3 roles in cardiac cells is not that clear. Now, our hypothesis is that IP3 receptors may not change the shape of the spark or duration, but they may affect their initiation probability. So, uh, check that hypothesis, we will model Spark. So that will be uh, 2D simulation of a Spark. So we have two micrometer space and we will run model for 80 milliseconds and we will uh, represent uh, mean fluorescence traces. Furthermore, we will tune our model using uh, line scan data. And we will try to answer, sorry for that, we will try to answer how Spark changes under different number of IP3 receptors. Then uh, we'll briefly show results how number of Sparks under different uh, uh, how Sparks can be initiated under different uh, initiation mechanisms. And finally, we'll briefly show how Spark changes under different IP3R open probability. Uh, the last part is important because we may have different um, isoforms of IP3s in uh, cardiac cells. And IP3 1 and 2 types will have different uh, open probability. So let's start for, from mathematical model. Uh, as mentioned before, we will have our dyad. Uh, in our model, we will be interested in junctional SR, network SR. Uh, we will have uh, a release flux through the channels from junctional SR to cytosol. Uh, then calcium can be returned through circa pumps from cytosol to network SR. And network SR uh, can refill calcium to GSI using G refill fluxes. Uh, also, we will have combined uh, buffer fluxes. Uh, notice that we won't have any flux from LCC channels, mostly because we have want to have conserved calcium quantity in our system, and we will be initiating uh, our sparks by uh, opening our receptors. So here you can see uh, the main uh, equations of each compartment. Uh, we will use the deterministic model, traditional ones, and since it is a spatial model, uh, here, a quick introduction of our spatial settings. So, as I mentioned, our simulation uh, is two micrometers long. Uh, in the middle, we will have located junctional SR and channels that are inside. This part is 0.2 micrometers. And then we have uh, IP3s and IWAS receptors located in this part. Uh, IWAS will be always fixed. Uh, while IP3s, we will have different numbers. 
Uh, both uh, AWAS and IP3s open and close stochastically. So uh, since both receptors uh, are opening stochastically, uh, we will introduce uh, AWAR open and IP3 open numbers that will be calculated stochastically. Uh, AWAR behavior will be uh, calculated using uh, Canal at all work. Uh, IP3 R receptors will be calculated using Pink uh, simplified model. Uh, and these parameters will be put to uh, G-release flux and they will go to deterministic equations. So let's go to the results. As I mentioned, we will start from simulations with different numbers of IP3s. So we tried uh, having 0 IP3s, 5 IP3s, 10 and 20. And here you can see the uh, mean trace of fluorescence. Uh, we also put uh, calcium concentration in GSR, number of open IP3Rs, uh, nothing here because we don't have uh, IP3 receptors, and we have number of opened RYRs. And uh, as you can see, it doesn't matter if we have 0, 5, 10 or 20 receptors, shape of spark remains the same. So, number of IP3s doesn't affect uh, spark shape so far. Now, since I, men uh, I mentioned before, we have both uh, AWARs and IP3s in our model, and we won't, we are not using LCC current to initiate spark. So we can initiate, uh, we can have simulations where we don't do anything. So we don't open any receptor at all and see what happens. We can try initiate Spark by opening certain numbers of IP3s. We chose five IP3s. Uh, then we tried initiate Spark using five RYRs, uh, a mixture of five IP3s and two IYRs. And finally, we had simulations where we continuously have one IP3 receptor opened. We call that leaking. Uh, IP3 trigger. And here you can see how many, uh, what percentage of simulations showed uh, a spark. And as you can see, only when we had opened five RYRs or when we had leaking IP3s, we actually managed to uh, initiate spark reliably or almost all the time. However, these initiations are a little bit different. So uh, here we plotted uh, times when sparks appeared. And as you can see, while when we opened five hours, sparks were initiated almost initially. Uh, when we had leaking IP3s, Spark appearance times were scattered much broader. Uh, so, again, to repeat, uh, even though leaking IP3Rs and opened RYRs showed Spark initiation in almost all simulation uh, runs, uh, Spark appearances times were different in both simulations. And just to illustrate how traces look like under five aware open case and leaking IP3 behavior. So uh, let's move on. As mentioned in cardiomyocytes, we have IP3, in, we have three isoforms of IP3 receptors, IP3-1, IP3-2, and IP3-3. Uh, type 2 is uh, predominant. And then we have type 1, which is uh, 
less expressed, but still uh, here. And uh, we know that type 2 IP3s and type 1 uh, IP3 receptors has different sensitivity to uh, calcium. So uh, we had uh, the open curve for type 1 based on Tengchung's model. However, we didn't have precise data to tune uh, type 2 p open probability. However, we knew calcium range in which uh, type 2 receptors were opened. So what we did was we took type 1 curve and we shifted to calcium ranges that is uh, uh, specific for uh, type 2 receptors. And then we repeated all simulations. Here you can see uh, our results. So we also had 5, 10, and 20 IP3s. Uh, and here it will be simulations with uh, type 2 receptors. Uh, as you can see, even though spark shape doesn't change much between 5 and 10 IP3 RS. Uh, when we have 20 IP3s, we can have slightly longer uh, duration of the spark. And as you can see, we have much more opened IP3 receptors uh, as well. So to sum up, shifted calcium sensitivity curve can slightly increase spark duration. Uh, but what about amplitude? We looked at amplitudes, and it doesn't look like number of IP3s affected amplitude that much, while duration, as, I meant, as it could have been seen from uh, previous figures, they uh, can slightly increase. Hmm. So, a quick summary. Our hypothesis was that IP3 receptors may not change the shape or duration of the spark, but they can affect their initiation probability. And our uh, analysis suggests that, yes, indeed, uh, there are situations when IP3 RS may not uh, affect the shape of the spark, but IP3s uh, will definitely affect spark initiations. So we saw that briefly open IP3s may not be sufficient to trigger spark. However, if we have leaking IP3s, then we can uh, have sufficient amount of calcium to travel from IP3s to our OS to synthesize neighboring OS, which leads to spark trigger. And why this analysis may be important or interesting? It's because in disease conditions, we have diets that can be uncoupled from electrical activations. And I would like to acknowledge all the people who worked in this work. So, VJ. Uh, my supervisor, my, another supervisor, Edmund Crampen, uh, postdoc David Ladd, PhD student Hilary Hunt, and we also got data from uh, Lou Roderick and Christian Sala. And the work was supported by Australian government. Uh, thank you for the listening. And any questions? Thank you very much, Agne. That uh, was a really nice talk. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience at the moment. I can ask. I can ask a question. You want to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Agne. Nice to meet you, Maurizio. Here talking. Um, a question regarding uh, the fact that of the disposition of these uh, receptors as clusters. So, what is the effect of the clustering component in the shaping of both amplitude and duration of these events? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I, are you interested in the number of receptors in the cluster or that thing is that they are close by and how that affects? 
Um, it could be that we have lost Maurizio. <laughs> so the problem is uh, Rizio, Maurizio is maybe, um, yeah, um, having connection issues. So um, I think um, the the question uh, was about um, the the yeah the how the numbers of clusters um, influence um, the shape of the the um, the sparks. Uh, so it's more like if we have uh, more calcium, so which can mm -hmm. happen when we have. Uh, more receptors or they are close to each other and influence each other, uh, we can have slightly different shape. So it can be yes. longer because they will keep longer uh, open for a longer time. And since we have, if we have much more calcium, it can be, it can diffuse a little bit further away and that will also uh, lead to us observing a broader spark. Mm -hmm. So I have a question as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when um, you think about um, what this means functionally, so um, one challenge that we um, have in calcium signaling is that um, actually many signals have um, to be transmitted using the same calcium in a way. So yes. um, we um, have, for example, the heartbeat um, that has to be um, regulated by the ryanidine receptors in the heart cells, but at the same time, the heart cell also has to do a lot of other things, for example, transcribing genes. Um, is there a role that IP3 receptors might um, play there by shaping the spark shape? Uh, we are really interested in that, but and that's why we are trying to, to create a model. But at the moment, mm -hmm. without connecting all uh, elements that influence uh, these systems, I don't think I would be able to answer precisely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, so what um, would you need to do to uh, be able to, to achieve that? So what is in a way um, uh, yeah, missing? So, from so the at the moment, we looked only at one spark and only brief ones. And if it is hard behavior, it would be much longer simulations and see how uh, sparks are initiated repeatedly. Also, uh, we haven't used LCC current, we just uh, mm -hmm. triggered sparks in other ways. So that's uh, another thing that may be added. And I'm pretty sure I can find a much fuller list, but I may go over time. <laughs> well, actually, you were really good at sticking to time. Yes. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> you were, were absolutely perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if there are uh, no 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 that was no dict at vj not at all i mean vj <laughs> was the first speaker and um he had a really really tough job because um i gave him a really long introduction and we had a lot of technical problems and uh, <laughs> i didn't want to insult vj at all <laughs> but so um if there are no further questions um I would like um, to invite our next speaker. It is uh, now my great pleasure to um, introduce um, our next speaker. Um, our next talk will be um, by um, Alexei Semyonov. Alexei uh, Semyonov um, got his uh, PhD actually um, in um, Pushchino. And um, Pushchino is a place that I had uh, a pleasure as well to visit as a PhD student. So that uh, was a nice surprise. Um, at the moment, um, Alexei Semyonov is a professor at the um, University of Nizhny Novgorod. Um, before he uh, went, uh, for example, to UCL for, uh, to University College London for postdocs. And um, he is also an honorary doctor there. Um, I, it is my great pleasure um, to um, introduce his talk. He will talk about the spatial temporal properties of calcium activity in single astrocytes and astrocytic networks. Hello everyone, uh, it's a great pleasure and nice to be invited to this uh, very interesting meeting. It's uh, very new for me, you know, to present uh, my stuff in, in such a way and um, 
Uh, in fact, the, the, there are some changes in my career, so I'm not no longer a professor at the University of Nizhny Novgorod. I uh, recently moved to Moscow and now a representative of the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry in Moscow. Uh, but my title is uh, also changed, uh, so you, you've seen this title advertised, Special Temporal Properties of Calcium Activity. Uh, in single astrocyte and astrocytic networks. But uh, since I realized that there will be another talk uh, from my colleague uh, Alexei Braget, who will present after me, uh, and uh, so we decided that he will talk about astrocytic networks. And uh, basically, I shortened this talk and I will give you more details about calcium activity in single astrocytes. And uh, before that, I would like to give you a very general introduction to astrocyte physiology because this meeting uh, about calcium activity in general and uh, this calcium activity important for all different kinds of cells. And uh, I would like to talk about why astrocytes, say a few words actually, why the astrocytes is so important. For a long time, uh, uh, we considered brain as a large neuronal network and tried to link all the activity and all the functions of the brain to neuronal plasticity, changes in neurons, etc. And the wiring of the brain, that, therefore we have several international programs of uh, neuronal connectomes, etc. But uh, the, in the last uh, three, four decades, uh, the new understanding of the brain functions start to emerge and uh, this includes all different other elements of the brain and other cells. Uh, for example, astrocytes also form a network in the brain. They connect it to each other through gap junctions. They have uh, some kind of uh, activity in, in form of, for example, calcium signaling. They also have signaling from uh, by release of glia transmitters, etc. And these astrocytes, for example, the human uh, brain outnumber neurons. Uh, uh, 1.3 or 1.4 astrocytes per neuron can be can be um, basically detected. And uh, what what uh, I would like to start with, I'd like to show you that neurons and astrocytes also interact at very different levels. A uh, few images from the review which we're preparing now with uh, Christian Hanneberger and Amit Agrawal, who is also talking at this meeting. And uh, this is interaction pretty much known. This is <clears throat> so-called tripartite synapse. Uh, when neuron uh, release a neurotransmitter to synaptic cleft, and this neurotransmitter not only activating postsynaptic receptors, but also can reach astrocytic processes and uh, receptors on them, triggering uh, calcium response in this process. And this calcium response can uh, produce release of um, other signals like glial transmitters, which uh, modulate uh, synaptic transmission and synaptic plasticity. Uh, on the level of astrocytic anatomic domains, uh, astrocytes also interact with uh, neurons, uh, with synapses, but that could be uh, also interesting from computational point of view because calcium uh, signals in astrocytic domain can uh, uh, occupy larger territories and can affect uh, by release of glial transmitters and uh, several synapses. Uh, or clusters of synapses. These clusters could be, or the same dendrites could be clusters on the neighboring dendrites. Therefore, uh, plasticity can be synchronized, or signaling can be synchronized or affected similarly in these synapses. And this could be uh, related both to excitatory and inhibitory synapses. When we go to the level of network interaction, when uh, a neuronal network interact with astrocytic network, it becomes even more interesting because calcium activity can uh, occupy larger territories within astrocytic uh, network, astrocytic syncytium, and can affect not only clusters of synapses, but also can affect uh, several neurons, therefore changing their properties, their excitability, etc. So uh, I call this guiding template because this guides electrical activity within neuronal network in this guiding template can be linked to calcium activity in astrocyte. And uh, astrocyte affect neurons, but neurons also can affect astrocyte because neuronal activity can trigger or modulate calcium responses in astrocytic network. And this is also quite interesting uh, sort of uh, feedback uh, because uh, then uh, we can imagine that 
uh, different uh, levels of neuronal activity can summon different guiding templates, different patterns of calcium activity and astrocytes. Therefore, uh, taking all this uh, computational, potential computational role of astrocytic networks and neuroglia interactions, it is very important to look at the mechanism by which calcium activity is generated, propagates, and etc. in astrocytes at the level of individual cells and the level of astrocytic networks. And actually, the phenomenon that calcium activity in astrocytes can propagate has been uh, uh, reported a long time ago uh, from very pioneering works. And here is the, one of the uh, first papers showing calcium activity in astrocytes. It was done in culture, Cornell Bell, Science 1990. And they already uh, noticed that calcium activity generates some kind of waves, and they attempted to measure this way, for example, if you look at the panel E, uh, you can see how the, they try to depict the front of the calcium wave and the size of the calcium wave over time. Uh, however, there was no uh, particular quantification uh, presented at this time, the measurements. And uh, later on, uh, again, uh, the same uh, group of people, the first author was young, uh, uh, they uh, reported uh, in 1998, uh, uh, they used the method which uh, was used for uh, thermal waves. So many actually methods for uh, image analysis coming from physics or from astronomy or from other uh, uh, fields, fields uh, unrelated, maybe uh, related to physical uh, phenomenon larger than to the calcium activity. And <clears throat> at that time, they suggested the method how they can detect individual <clears throat> special temporal calcium events. And they found that, uh, that most of calcium events uh, are very small, but some events getting larger. And uh, then they looked at the distribution of these events and discovered a fairly, a fairly interesting phenomenon. So what you can see here, this is a, a, a probability of finding of event of particular size. Uh, and this is, uh, look, uh, not the um, double logarithmic scale here. And uh, when you see, uh, in double logarithmic scale distribution become linear, it uh, might suggest that this is power law. And the power law uh, distributions, it's a very interesting distribution, uh, and it was, uh, it's characteristic for such things like scale-free systems, it might be related to such physical phenomena as self-organized criticality, and also can be related to the certain information content of this calcium activity. And this uh, was a quite interesting discovery at that time, but then uh, the things changed. And uh, we started a long period of region of interest based uh, analysis uh, of calcium activity in astrocyte. Region of interest based analysis is um, quite a classic and standard technique uh, in calcium imaging or any type of imaging. So what you can do, you can just image your cell and then you uh, plot uh, region of interest uh, as you like. For example, this is the simplest approach. You can put a uh, region of interest where, wherever you like. Uh, for example, this is an astrocyte. You can put several region of interest in all the processes, and then you can uh, measure, uh, look at the activity. And even with this technique, you can see that calcium activity is different in different parts of astrocyte, independently starts, propagates, etc. Uh, this method evolved over time, and uh, here I, I would like to uh, briefly only show because uh, this uh, work may be Amit Agarwal will talk about this um, in greater detail. But this approach evolved and became smart ROI approach. So basically, analysis uh, it's before setting the ROIs and finding places where the calcium activity uh, generated in astrocyte, the overall activity is analyzed, and this uh, region is called uh, microdomains, and these microdomains can be defined, and activity can be uh, analyzed over time in these microdomains. Uh, however, we decided to move uh, back to this approach of looking at the special temporal uh, properties of calcium events, and started with a quite simple uh, model. This is cultured astrocyte, and so, so this cultured astrocyte has uh, these big processes. And in these processes, we can uh, look at the calcium activity. And what you can see here, it's accelerated 10 times movie, in which uh, you can uh, have uh, sort of um, delta F over F change in the fluorescence, and this flashes 
uh, you can uh, monitor in this astro site and then uh, we started to uh, analyze this activity frame by frame and so in this frame by frame analysis we, we uh, detect individual calcium events and this individual calcium events uh, can be monitored uh, in 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 each frame until they exist and then we set the threshold and after we set the threshold we can uh, outline the territory of this event we can uh, count the number of frames the event existed so therefore we can get duration of the event and we can even reconstruct this events in uh, three-dimensional space x y and time so in this individual event you can appreciate how it evolves in space and time and then we can get maximum projection and this maximum projection uh, corresponds to the uh, size of this calcium event and then we look at the uh, uh, events, individual events, and we find events of different uh, sizes, durations, and uh, on this uh, slide uh, you can uh, basically see events, uh, some events are very small, some events larger, uh, other events are uh, very large and they last longer, they can propagate within the cell, and uh, these events also start all over the place in, in different uh, processes. And then we looked at the distribution of uh, uh, event sizes, maximal projection of these events, and we looked at the distribution of event duration, so we can me measure both of these parameters. And again, uh, we discovered that they follow the power law, the same like in, in uh, Young uh, and Coulter's paper. And this uh, was pretty interesting uh, because, uh, again, this is uh, related to many uh, different interesting phenomena. Of course, uh, both of this work, uh, Young and our work, were done in uh, cultured astrocytes. Uh, but uh, cultured astrocytes, as we all know, develop uh, very peculiar properties. They might not necessarily follow the same uh, properties uh, as astrocytes which developed in vivo. And uh, to, understand, to look what happens in astrocytes if, when they develop in a proper way, with all neuronal environment and in 3D, uh, we started to do the same experiment in uh, experiments and slices and later on uh, what we do right now in viva. So I show you first the <clears throat> results obtained in a hippocampal slice. Uh, so we uh, got hold of a mouse which, in which uh, calcium sensor GCAMP2 was expressed in uh, astrocyte-specific manner. And then we <clears throat> again performed this analysis. This is calcium uh, imaging, uh, and you can see an accelerated movie uh, where you see the flashes of delta F over F changes in calcium fluorescence. Then we performed analysis. We detected individual calcium events, and we found that they also come in different sizes and the uh, probability of uh, smaller calcium events much higher than uh, larger calcium events and they follow uh, also power law distribution and <clears throat> here uh, comes the summary of uh, this part of my talk uh, we discovered that uh, calcium activity in astrocyte if you look at the special temporal properties of calcium events uh, fol follows power law distribution that means that uh, also, there are many small uh, calcium events present in astrocytic domain, larger calcium events, which are very infrequent, uh, but they uh, carry most of the calcium. This is, uh, Paolo, is a so-called heavy tail distribution. And uh, what I don't have time to show you, we performed uh, experiments when we stimulated astrocytes. We stimulated neurons, we applied agonist of metabotropic receptors on astrocytes, and what we discovered that actually all those stimulations which previously thought to trigger uh, new calcium events on astrocytes actually affect their properties, they, they affect their sizes. And what we see as a result, we see the change in the slope of power or distribution. And this suggests that uh, uh, when we stimulate neurons, we change the size and the size of calcium events in astrocyte increases. And this might also change the properties of the calcium activity pattern, which is very important for interaction with neuronal network, as I started with my, in my introduction. And uh, this is, was uh, like already some time ago, this is uh, published work. And uh, after our publication, there were several uh, very interesting papers published uh, which uh, analyzed the special temporal properties of calcium activity. 
Uh, and here is the slide uh, sh showing you 30 years of special temporal calcium event analysis in astrocytes, uh, starting with uh, pioneering works of Cornell Bell, Young, uh, and then uh, later on in 2015-2016, uh, there was very interesting two papers from uh, laboratory of Yuji Kigaya from uh, Tokyo University when they uh, first applied this kind of analysis not for individual calcium events but for, uh, uh, to pattern of calcium events within astrocytic domain. So they reconstructed the old activity in astrocytes within, within the anatomic domain and they looked frame by frame how this uh, pattern changes. And later on, uh, 2019 uh, was uh, uh, quite a big progress in this methods of analysis with appearance of uh, software, uh, astrocyte quantitative analysis software known as Aqua, which uh, all offers a uh, way of detecting uh, calcium events, also looking at the uh, propagation path, direction, speed of propagation, etc. So we start to get more parameters from this calcium activity. And uh, of course, we also continue our research and what we, next question which we uh, asked was how this uh, calcium activity actually starts. So we looked at individual events, but what happens uh, with the, the starting points? What determines their initiations? And uh, here you can see another video uh, at, 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 at this slide. Uh, and this video shows you the calcium activity in individual astrocyte. This is accelerated, of course, moving many times. And then you, uh, uh, in the next movies, ne next to it, you can see initiation points. So I, I will uh, start it again. So on, on the left side, you see calcium events, delta F or F. On the right side, you see uh, uh, spots of initiation. So, uh, and then uh, we wanted to see how these initiation points related to particular anatomical properties of astrocyte. And uh, it's very difficult to sort of get anatomical properties of astro astrocytic leaflets if you do uh, uh, calcium, if, if you do optical imaging. So you need to use uh, super resolution optical imaging or you need to use electron microscopy imaging. Uh, but even with super resolution optical imaging, you probably will not get all the finest uh, processes uh, correctly. Uh, and electron microscopy imaging has all limitations, as we all know. So basically, we had to find a way around how to make the profile of, uh, of astrocyte and how to sort of quantify uh, anatomical properties of astrocyte. And we used the method which was suggested in the laboratory of Dmitry Rusakov. And the idea of this method is that if you can look at the fluorescence, the volume fraction of uh, uh, astrocytic processes, uh, which the volume which they occupy in the space, and then uh, you can, uh, for example, measure the fluorescence of soma, and this uh, soma we assume that occupies 100% of volume fraction, and then if you make a ratio of fluorescence of uh, um, all these processes within astrocytic domain to the fluorescence of soma, you will get uh, uh, per percentage of volume which this process occupy. And this is the image of such volume fractions. Soma is uh, normalized to 100%, and then you can see volume fraction of different astrocytic processes. Thicker processes, of course, have high volume fractions. Thinner processes have uh, lower volume fraction. Of course, this is combination of uh, different small processes which uh, happen to be in one particular pixel which we analyze. And uh, on the on the very right, you can see uh, the profile. If you make uh, profiles across SOMA, you will see SOMA comes to one. This is normalized, of course, this is uh, no, not real fluorescence, but this is uh, normalization. And then you can see such profiles where you can identify thick processes and you can identify fine processes. And this is very convenient because then you can link calcium activity to thick processes, to fine processes, to SOMA, et, et cetera. And that's what we have done, first of all, we analyze the profiles of several astrocytes. This is just four of them shown here, but we've done many more. And then we found the probability of finding pixels with different volume fraction within astrocytic uh, anatomic domain. And this is the, this you can see here, volume fraction probability. Most of the processes, of course, are fine uh, 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 in, in astrocyte. And then we look at the initiation points and we figured out that this initiation points uh, of calcium activity correspond to particular set of, of volume fractions, to particular thickness uh, of, the, of this process. It was 
kind kind of interesting. They are not corresponding to very thin processes. They are not corresponding to very thick. So there is optimal thickness of ast astrocytic uh, processes, and this is very interesting from a uh, point of view that astrocytes are highly plastic morphologically, and they they can change uh, 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 under different uh, influences, circumstances, and uh, physiological states. And how how to explain this phenomenon? And this is the only model which I included in, in my presentation. Of course, we had um, a few more models, uh, but again, I, I wanted to show you the uh, experimental data first because they can be relevant for uh, other models and the models we can discuss uh, separately if, if you have any questions. But the model uh, is, uh, is very simple here. So what we modeled, uh, we modeled a cylindrical uh, compartment, let's say the, the piece of astrocytic process, and this cylindrical compartment contains cylindrical endoplasmic reticulum and had all the sort of fluxes, influx of calcium, efflux from IP4 receptors, etc. And then uh, this uh, calcium activity in this process was driven by stochastic calcium influx through the plasma membrane. And this uh, stochastic in influx was uh, set uh, similar for all the all, all these compartments. And what we varied, we varied the surface to volume ratio of this compartment. So we basically made it smaller or thicker, uh, this process, uh, but kept the plasma reticulum in place. And what we found that when we changed the diameter of the process, so D, uh, 8 micrometers, 5 micrometers, 1 micrometer, and we start to see the thinner the process, the higher probability of calcium activity to be, be triggered by this stochastic calcium influx. This is calcium-dependent calcium release. And, uh, of course, uh, at some point, the process was so thin that they couldn't, it couldn't contain any endoplasmic reticulum. And of course, at this case, we didn't have any amplification and we didn't have any calcium activity. And this was exactly corresponding to what they observed in experimental conditions. But this finding actually points to important role of endoplasmic reticulum, because endoplasmic reticulum we fixed here, but endoplasmic reticulum can vary in size and amount within the cell. And uh, then we uh, decided to look what happens to the plasmic reticulum, how the plasmic reticulum is distributed within astrocyte. And we started to use electron microscopy. This is serial section electron microscopy 3D reconstruction of astrocytes. What we can see here, we can see here the pale uh, green. This is uh, astrocytic processes. You can uh, see that uh, not all of them contain uh, organelles, these are finest astrocytic processes which come to synapses, they are organelle free. And also, uh, you see thick organelles, so so called branches. And in these branches, we can see mitochondria, we can see endoplasmic reticulum. I'm not going to stop on mitochondria here. This is a uh, subject which you probably uh, better hear from uh, Amit Agarwal, who's, who's giving a talk here at this, uh, at this meeting. Uh, but uh, we decided to look at the plasmic reticulum, which is involved in the calcium dynamics and can trigger calcium. Uh, release um, and calcium amplification of calcium signals. And what you can see here, this in the plasmic reticulum is stained in blue and in red. When the calcium reticulum is stained in blue, it corresponds to surface uh, to volume ratio of calcium in the plasmic reticulum uh, smaller, and if it's in red, it's higher surface to volume ratio. And surface here, it's the surface in the plasmic reticulum, and volume is volume of cytoplasm. So basically, it's kind of inverted surface to volume ratio. So we wanted to see how much surface of endoplasmic reticulum facing cytoplasm in particular compartment of astrocyte. And then we looked at the distribution of these points, and we found three peak distribution, uh, blue peak, uh, red peak, and sort of violet peak. You can see here, they also paint in the same way. The blue peak, it corresponds to this kind of cisterna of endoplasmic reticulum, which not connected basically to all the, the network of the endoplasmic reticulum. The, the violet is the main sort of uh, cisterna which forming these pipelines, and the red one is the most interesting. These are so what we call tangles of endoplasmic reticulum. And these tangles, if you can appreciate, they're located in some places where it looks like the branching points uh, happen. And so we decided to see if these tangles indeed related to branching points. 
and uh, then we traced uh, astrocytic processes that we traced the, the branches and then we look at the distribution of endoplasmic reticulum and volume fraction of endoplasmic reticulum within astrocytic process and we found quite interesting phenomena we found that endoplasmic reticulum uh, peaks increases just uh, uh, near the branching point and this is the d distance to branching point is zero negative it's uh, like before branching point positive after branching point this is away from the from the soma and we see that uh, the branching point of plasma critical increases and the distant distal branch that is start to decrease so there is a certain distribution which might regulate uh, calcium dynamics Sorry, and then uh, i would just like to say you have about two minutes left Okay, then I will accelerate and quickly show the calcium imaging that, that will uh, uh, terminate my talk. So this is calcium imaging, and then we look how this calcium imaging uh, basically, uh, and how, how this calcium events basically link to distribution of endoplasmic reticulum. So this is a reconstruction. This uh, on, on, on the left side you see a video, then it's 3D reconstruction and space, space and time of calcium events. And then we looked at the uh, mean projection of uh, calcium events into anatomical uh, structure. And we looked at the projection of these calcium events, how they associated with a branching point uh, of the astrocyte. And then uh, we uh, analyzed also individual calcium events. We analyzed how individual calcium events propagate, spread, uh, within these branching points, and we observe that calcium events actually not starting in branching points. They're starting in the thin astrocytic process, and then they move to this branching point, and in this branching point, they ignite calcium response. And when the calcium response uh, moves to branching point, we can see very bright uh, flash of calcium activity. So this branching point indeed shows that the uh, endoplasmic reticulum may be increased there. We also looked at the rise in decay rates of calcium activity. Uh, here you can see uh, again uh, uh, video uh, frames uh, where we show the uh, first derivative of delta F over F. The red is the rise of the calcium activity and blue is decay of calcium activity. And again, we see faster rise and faster decay uh, of calcium events within these branching points. <clears throat> and here is the maximum projection of this. Uh, uh, calcium events, the, 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 the rates of rise and decay, and they uh, pretty nicely correspond to branching points. Also, not all branching points actually light up, so there might be some different types of branching points. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and I would like to uh, deliver three messages, home, take home messages. First, that neuronal activity modulates spontaneous calcium events in astrocytes in a way that it changes their properties. Of course, neuronal activity can trigger calcium events in astrocytes, but existing calcium events in astrocytes may be modulated and their sizes and durations can change on, 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 upon activation of neurons. Uh, probability of calcium event, events initiation linked to the astrocytic morphology, and it's higher in, in the process with higher surface to volume ratio. And then the plasmic reticulum forms tangles in branching points of astrocytic process. And these tangles involved in amplification of calcium signals, and maybe to some extent can be linked to uh, so called calcium, uh, calcium micro domains, which measured with uh, a smart ROI approach. And on this, I would like to thank. Uh, uh, people who are currently working in my lab, some of them participated in, in this data which I presented here, and collaborators from the University of Nizhny Novgorod, former lab members, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexei, for your really nice talk. I'm sorry that I had to speed you up a bit. Um, there is one question from the audience, uh, from Alexander Skupin, so I will read it out in the uh, interest of time. So he asks, in case we still have time, maybe I have missed it due to connection issue, but what is the relation or correlation between the duration and size of calcium events? And is it preserved when changing alpha due to stimulation? Well, size, size of calcium events, they correlate to some extent to duration of calcium events indeed. 
the larger calcium vents tend to be longer uh, than uh, smaller calcium vents. Also, there is no direct uh, correlation. So there could be some events which last longer and stay uh, very localized. There could be some events which spread, but uh, sort of stop quickly. So th th there is no sort of 100% uh, correlation, but there is some, of course, uh, it takes uh, more time to develop with, for into, into large calcium events. If I understood, understood the question correctly. I am inviting our next speaker on screen. Um, so to our next speaker, I um, have to apologize as well because um, I um, don't even know if I will be able to pronounce your name correctly. So I think Alexei Braje, is that correct? Yeah, that's good. Um, that is correct. Okay. Um, yeah, my second apology is that I don't know you as well, Alexei, as Maurizio, and Maurizio um, has really, really bad network problems. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I can really properly introduce you. So the only thing I really know is that you have been at uh, Lomonosov University in Moscow for a very long time and that you're a senior research scientist um, at the Department of Biophysics. Is that uh, kind of correct? Yeah, that's true. Is there anything I, I should should add? Well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I've um, graduated. I, mean, I, I def defended uh, my PhD thesis from Moscow State University in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I also worked as a postdoc in uh, then Technical University of Denmark uh, with Eric Moskiller and, mm -hmm. and um, University of Copenhagen with Martin Laubitzen. Okay. All right. So, and now I'm I'm working both in at Moscow State University and uh, Institute for Biogenetic Chemistry. Mm hmm. Okay. So, um, what um, I think we um, now need to do just start sharing your screen. Now, so we will stay with um, astrocytes um, and. Um, in a way, as I understand, your talk will be um, a continuation of the previous talk by um, Alexei in some sense. So I'm looking forward to your talk on patterns of astrocytic calcium activity. <laughs> yeah, in fact, yes, it is a um, <clears throat> continuation of the talk. Uh, and uh, so I'll continue from where Alexei uh, finished and first of all I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk to such an audience it's an honor for me uh, and I would like to thank beforehand before I start before I begin I would like to thank all those people who actually uh, performed the experiments and collected the experimental data because without data there wouldn't be anything to analyze a model um, <clears throat> So this is a quick outline of the talk. Uh, most of the introductory work or labor has been done by Alexei Simyanov. So I don't have to spend time on that. And I'll talk about our approach to denoising of the calcium emission data and which descriptors of calcium activity uh, that we use at network level. Uh, I'll show a brief example of uh, the kind of data we collect from awake behaving animals. And if I have time, I'll uh, continue with our morphology based model of consume activity. <clears throat> Collecting imaging data, uh, calcium imaging data in astrocytes uh, has a challenges. Uh, and some challenges are shared with other modalities or other structures of interest such as neurons and such uh, some of, uh, of the challenges are unique to astrocytes. Uh, if we're using GCAMPs then we often have to res uh, result to low photon count and high BMT gain uh, imaging which results in very much non-bosonian noise in data that has to be dealt with. So there's a bosonian non gaussian uh, noise that has to be treated uh, in a special way. Uh, apart from neuronal uh, calcium images, we can't rely on the existence of stationary spatial sources of uh, signal like neuronal bodies 
so or clear cut uh, special temporal scales because we have lots of different kinds of activity such as micro domain activity waves uh, full special domain or intercellular waves and these waves can be traveling or expanding shrinking uh, so they are less behaved than neurons in, in some sense and the uh, Observed activity in the field of view can be sparse or abundant, can be waxing and waning, so we need to process large data volumes often. And as in different kinds of imaging, that data can be collected in different modalities, such as single photon and two photon on white field or confocal, or on different setups, but it would be nice if we could treat the data in a uniform way. <clears throat> so let me begin with our approach to pre-processing and noising. So now routinely what we do first is that we try to convert all the data from PMT uh, counts to photon counts. So we try to find the, the parameters of PMT gain and offset or effective PMT gain and offset. And it's important to do because for instance, if we want to measure delta F over F, or background fluorescence level. And it doesn't make sense if the PMT offset is a few thousand because we then have to divide by a very large number, which doesn't make sense. So we want to find out what is the expected photon count or the modeled photon count. And here I would like to present uh, an example of our denoison results. So to the right, you see, um, yes, you can see my mouse pointer. So this is an example of single astrocyte image, imaged, uh, and it is uh, GCAMP. Uh, and uh, you see the five frame average uh, of, of, the, of, of the astrocyte. Uh, so it's not even a single frame. And you can see it's quite noisy. And to the right, you see uh, a single denoised image, so which, is, which looks prettier. And below that, you can see the uh, time traces or time signals from the two rows, red and blue. And so you see the raw or unprocessed data from the ROI and the noise. It is still a bit noisy, but it is much better than the raw. And then we can show that the, the actual distribution, the statistics of the expected uh, photon counts uh, is not very much affected by denoising because if we compare the uh, fluorescence uh, values uh, between the average raw frame and average denoised frame, they are practically identical. Uh, but uh, just to show you how, how wide the distribution can be or with a very long tail uh, if we uh, analyze the raw data and we make it substantially more Gaussian uh, when we denoise the data. And actually, we not only make it Gaussian, we reduce the noise. And here are a few examples so that it works in different modalities. Again, to the left is the raw uh, image data, and to the right is the process, the noise data. And this one is uh, OGB and sulforodamine 101 uh, in vivo in cortex. Uh, here, it's not a very hard task to denoise these data because um, it's due to, to the usage of synthetic dyes. Uh, you have a high photon counts and the, the noise looks approximately Gaussian, so it's okay to, to, to work with and uh, to produce nice uh, denoised results. But it changes substantially if we switch to uh, confocal GCAMP uh, data that we uh, image in uh, that has been imaged in uh, Alexei Semyonov's lab. Uh, here it uses two color co uh, channels. Uh, the red one is autofluorescence and helps to guide to overall uh, anatomy or morphology of the slice. So it's a hypercampal CA1 slice, and what you see here is the band of um, pyramidal neurons. And in green is GCAMP. And you can see that uh, in noisy uh, raw images, um, 
you don't see the morphology as to frame per frame, but of course you do see uh, calcium events. And to the right, you can see both the actual the morphology of the astrocytes, or at least those astrocytes that have been uh, contagious by the uh, virus. So it's an AV injection. Uh, it also works in 2 p.m. settings, like here, it's uh, in vivo and it's been imaged on an awake uh, mouse uh, in cortex. And here you see a um, nice interaction between uh, astrocytic calcium activity and uh, vessel diameter changes. And you can see bright green stripes uh, along the uh, vessel borders, which correspond to astrocytic and feed, of course. <clears throat> so, the um, denoising seems to, seems to work. We also have tested in, in uh, synthetic or toy data, which we tried to, to make uh, uh, hard to, to work with, like this one. Uh, so, to the left, you can see uh, ground truth or synthesized data, which has stationary a uh, structure and a moving object so which uh, changes its shape and size. So we have both uh, spatial and temporal changes or temporal dynamics in the video. Uh, in the middle is the corrupted uh, noisy e input that is uh, passed to, uh, to the algorithm. And um, <clears throat> what we use here is a model of Poisson um, noise uh, created by uh, the detector and uh, to the right is the noised uh, data. Obviously it's not perfect because there is not so much information in the noise input but still you can see the, the uh, general outline of the stationary structures and the moving object. Uh, and the what what is nice about this uh, toy data that it doesn't rely on uh, some clearly defined spatial scales or stationary input sources. Um, it would be nice also to have toy data that is um, more linked to astrocytic morphology and we also do that to test our denoising algorithm. Uh, here we use the um, time averaged projection of uh, real data and add uh, artificially uh, events of different sizes and uh, activities uh, to the data and then corrupt it with noise and uh, look at the denoised uh, result. So what you can see here is that both uh, small scale uh, hotspots or micro domains or larger Area, activated areas uh, are picked up by the denoised algorithm. To conclude here is that this algorithm can be used as a pre-processing tool before uh, any further analysis like, for instance, before aqua or before other kinds of analysis. This is um, I won't show aqua results here. What I will show is a slightly different approach to looking at the uh, activity at the uh, network level. So again, this is the ex vivo. This is acute hip hippocampal slice in CA1 region, and it's both autofluorescence and GCAMP. And um, on the top, in the top, you can see the band of uh, pyramidal cell layer and astrocytes. <laughs> and uh, here are the, just a few examples of the row fluorescence uh, signal of the GCAMP and the denoised. So you can see morphology and everything. Uh, this is the, the video with, uh, with this. So, <clears throat> um, which shows the uh, uh, positive sides of uh, denoising algorithm that we use. Now let's uh, let's uh, have a look at our, the calcium activity that we see in, in this data. So here uh, to the left, what you see is fluorescence uh, in the denoised 
uh, variant of it. And below you see delta ref over f. And what this tracks over time here is, uh, so to speak, a distribution of all the delta ref over f values in the whole frame over time. So this is the median and the five to 95 percentiles and uh, interquartile range. Here, the, to the total uh, active area and uh, the um, average uh, area of the uh, event that, it, that is uh, present in the frame, in the field of view, and the total number of um, events are currently active. Uh, what it, and the quarters to the left are the uh, 10, 15, and 25% uh, change in delta ref or ref. What you see here primarily is that the activity level the, on the, at the population level is more linked to the large individual events like this one, the, these two. Uh, and uh, the overall number of active events of different sizes uh, doesn't change that much. And you can see that actually the, you can observe different astrocytic domains uh, activating and quite rarely, but still even in uh, this setting, this uh, ex vivo, you can see uh, occasional transmission of the calcium wave from astrocytic domain to astrocytic domain. This is the same uh, data set, but um, convert, converted from video to uh, time projection. Uh, to the left, what we uh, see uh, is uh, all the events uh, detected by the algorithm and the projection of the average frame and uh, the uh, standard deviation of the fluctuations of calcium activity here and um, the average amplitude of an event at, at different points and the, the overall uh, percentage of frame that were active frames that were active. What you see here is that yeah, there are quite distinct uh, hotspots of activity uh, that are activated and the brightest uh, points are soma and uh, large branch regions because if they activate they lead to very strong delta f over f signal but uh, as we will see uh, later the most of uh, events actually originate from peripheral uh, periphery of the spatial domains and we can see that the overall uh, population level activity changes over time, it fluctuates, but these fluctuations are mostly governed by single uh, large events, not the increase, not so much an increase in number of events, but the uh, occurrence of large events that cover the whole astrocytic domains or several domains, which is which can be seen here. Uh, so here is the um, maximum or statistics of uh, single event areas uh, visible in the field of view at different times and the overall number of active pixels and uh, number of active events in the frame. And we can see that actually the maximum event area, so if the area of a single event uh, correlates with the total active area in the field of view better than the number of events. Another interesting uh, property to look at is the kinetics of delta ref or ref uh, changes, like where the uh, delta ref or ref signal increases or decreases, and how fast does it do that? Uh, and uh, what we see here in red is the areas with increasing fluores uh, fluorescence level, and in blue, areas with decreasing fluorescence level. <clears throat> Of course, the, the, uh, the two are correlated. So we first see, for instance, like here, an increase in uh, ra raising fluorescence and then increase in area with uh, decaying fluorescence. <clears throat> and uh, what we can see from this movie also is that the highest rate of change is in uh, the somatic region because the signals are very large there. This is the 
overall summary of this movie. Uh, so these are the maximum projection of the rate of uh, positive rate of change, the, where the d delta ref over ref over the t is uh, positive, and the decay uh, change where the d delta ref over ref over the t uh, is uh, negative. And we can see that uh, this is related to morphology. So the, the Samata regions and the primary branches have the highest rate of change. Whereas uh, in the periphery, there are occasional uh, microdomains or hotspots with uh, fast change in uh, uh, calcium uh, signal rate of change. And at the uh, population level, uh, as shown in the graph below, we can see that uh, there are also fluctuations of activity. So you can see uh, an increase in overall uh, events with high rate of uh, rise or decay in fluorescence, and then the periods of uh, more or less silence. This is just to demonstrate that the um, rate of change is linked to the amplitude of the event or amplitude of change in delta ref or ref, and also that the rate of change in price and rate of change in decay are, are, are correlated. So to the left, you can see that the rate of rise is correlated to the rate of decay, and the slope is not exactly one, it's uh, a bit shifted to rise, meaning that rises are faster than decays, which is can be expected because the rise is uh, governed by the uh, positive feedback loop of uh, calcium induced calcium release, uh, while decay is uh, governed by um, other physiological mechanisms such as um, circo pump activity. But also, what we can see is that if we take the average fluorescence level uh, within one event and um, plot it against the average uh, rate of change or rate of rise of fluorescence, uh, we see that they are also correlated. So the, the higher the amplitude, uh, it may be trivial, uh, but it's in interesting to observe that the higher uh, amplitude of the signal, the faster it uh, has to rise uh, within uh, the time scale of uh, how fast the image. Alexei, you have around five Next, minutes. we can look at the sites where the events are initiated. So we uh, collect all the events uh, and uh, collect just the first few frames of, of each event and map the occurrence rates of that this pixel is uh, being involved in initiating of the event. And what we see is um, a constellation of hotspots where the events um, uh, originated more often than in uh, other areas. Um, and if we collect these uh, uh, calcium activity, uh, fluorescence activity in these uh, initiation sites and just uh, look at the raster plot of that, uh, rise, we can see a lot of activity going on. So these areas are hotspots of activity, whereas if we uh, randomly select rows in the field of view, uh, what we see is much less activity. So the the areas where events initiate uh, can be characterized by high level of spontaneous activity, which may or may not lead to uh, spreading of event, but um, uh, there can be an abundance of short-lived uh, sparks over there. Uh, we can also uh, look at uh, the distribution of uh, these initiation points and like uh, how frequently they led to uh, activation of events and uh, this is shown in the distribution to the left uh, to, uh, can we here compare the areas the full areas of the first few frames of events uh, to the actual peaks of where the uh, initiation was the most likely and what we see is a nice exponential curve here so most areas, uh, even if they are um, initiation sites, they, they don't generate events very frequently. 
but uh, quite a few events, uh, like a few events can be more active than others. And uh, if, if you see the yellow lines here that connects these uh, individual peaks, uh, if we measure the point to point distance between events, we can see that uh, there is a peak uh, clustered at around uh, two, uh, 20 micrometers. Now let me continue to in vivo awake animals. Uh, so this is the uh, preparation with uh, AAV injection and uh, the mouse is uh, head fixed uh, to the imaging platform, which is a levitated uh, circle, which can, so the, the mouse can uh, uh, run on it, uh, move in it uh, under it. And what I can show here is, um, <clears throat> so this is the, location of the mouse uh, with respect to uh, to the levitating platform and to the right is the change in fluorescence uh, so in astrocytes and uh, this track is um, the history of mouse uh, locations and color code uh, in here shows the speed of the mouse so what we see is that when the mouse is active it uh, runs we see an increase in activity uh, and if the mouse is um, stationary, there is, uh, there is very little activity. This is summarized in the next slide where we uh, correlate delta F signal with uh, speed. So this color code in the pillar here is the mouse speed. And uh, in this uh, 3D box, you see uh, delta F over F. What we see here is that uh, an initiation of the wave of activity is characterized by synchronization of uh, calcium activity over the whole field of view, but then the synchronization uh, breaks apart, which uh, can be seen here in uh, the number of segments that continues to, to be high, even if the, the, the activity uh, wanes after the uh, burst of locomotion, which means that there was a large event uh, that gets segmented and uh, each different parts um, uh, decay uh, in fluorescence at uh, different uh, temporal uh, scales. So here you see two bouts of uh, mouse uh, motor activity, which are linked to uh, large uh, waves of calcium activity in astrocyte, astrocytes, and that is sensory motor cortex. Now, I think I have... Um, Alexei, you have around uh, one minute left. ...to talk left. about our model. So we try to, to understand uh, the special temporal properties of calcium activity in terms of the model. And what we try to do is to, to make a both simple and data-driven model uh, of uh, calcium activity in astrocytes. So we take experimental images of astrocytes and uh, define calcium... Uh, dynamics in terms of uh, differential equations uh, at each point and both diffusion rates uh, between neighboring areas and uh, the uh, relative input of membrane bound or plasma membrane bound uh, mechanisms and uh, endoplasmic uh, reticulum bound mechanisms such as calcium induced calcium release via IP3 receptors depend on uh, the estimated uh, astrocytic volume fraction in the end. And the, the model is driven stochastically by uh, small sparks of uh, external glutamate, which lead to also to sparks uh, in uh, calcium. And as shown here in a single astrocyte, uh, low, uh, low drive, low excitation leads to confined small events and uh, increased excitation lead to, to the conscious of event uh, occupy the whole spatial domain. Alex, uh, you have uh, two minutes to yes. conclude, please. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so the most interesting thing, thing that we observe here is an emergen emergence of self-repeating patterns. So even though the, uh, the drive is stochastic, uh, what we see is uh, that uh, the activation, the whole frame activation, uh, can be self-repeating. And it is uh, also preserved in uh, multicellular uh, templates, where 
uh, the succession of individual cells that activate um, can be repeated and what we learned to do is how to map the repeatability of uh, different areas which is shown here. So to summarize, uh, we propose a new denosing algorithm and validate it on experimental and toy data. Uh, and then denosing can be followed by delta F over F analysis of choice. And we see large fluctuations of activity at population level, especially in vivo, which is linked to locomotion. And the total active area in the field of view is often linked to large individual events like occupy, occupying a whole astrocytic domain or a big part of an astrocytic domain or even several astrocytes and less so to the actual number of different events or number of small events. Uh, <clears throat> and the kinetic properties of the calcium dependent fluorescence that we observe in our data are linked to morphology. And initiation sites of activity are clustered they, and uh, these hotspots uh, of activity lead to initiation of events. And our modeling uh, which is arguably a simplification of the 3D structure of an astrocyte. Still, interestingly, it predicts emergence of uh, morphology-dependent morphology repeatable activation patterns, uh, even though the activation is uh, completely random. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, Ivo, I'll take the questions, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll go on. So we start with, uh, while I invite the audience to ask a couple of questions, before uh, we take a break of 15 minutes. I'll go on with the first question by Carlos Vivarias at the University of Lausanne. And uh, he's asking a uh, little bit of technical issues on what is the frame rate for the movies uh, and that you have shown in particular, where is uh, and what is the algorithm for the averaging the signal? And um, how do you detect the ROIs? Right. Um, let me move back. So here the, uh, the, the imaging frame rate, oops, seem to have a technical, okay. The, the imaging frame rate is shown here. So, so it's basically, uh, we, here we image at, uh, one Hertz, uh, ex vivo and in vivo we imaged at uh, 30 hertz, this is a re resonant scanner, but it's been uh, downsampled or been tempor temporarily been to uh, about six frames per second. Yeah, so that was as to frame rates. And to the ROIs, uh, basically we thresh threshold delta F over F uh, and uh, remove the uh, scattered small uh, pieces that, that are smaller than a certain threshold. And after after denosing, it can be easier easier to do. Uh, and it's for the what was that uh, uh, averaging? in the denoising algorithm uh, as far as I understood the question. Well, basically it is uh, following the po now popular approach. Uh, so we uh, look, or we, we introduce small windows and then uh, try to do um, specify and transforms uh, in, in the small windows and uh, reject the small amplitude components there and then project back from the specify and transform. And okay. I suppose that uh, we will see uh, a few denoising uh, algorithms uh, in this session that uh, build on a similar uh, mindset. Okay, I, we have still time for a couple of questions. So Audrey uh, is asking from Okinawa, uh, Japan. Uh, if uh, uh, the hotspots that you are measuring are actually how stable uh, they are in time, and I would also add in space, 
and whether you have some kind of already model set up that is uh, going in the direction of being able to reproduce this uh, stability or lack thereof. That's uh, a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, the hotspots of activity se seem to be quite stable uh, over time. If you look at the detail, uh, I suppose. Issues. Uh, that the event actually over the whole recording, which is um, 1,800 seconds, uh, the events uh, tend to originate at the same at the same spots over the whole recording. So they they are quite safe. Also, uh, what we can see is that there can be a confined uh, regions of an astrocyte that are activated uh, more frequently than other regions, but the, flu the fluorescent signal can be confined to these regions. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't spread out readily. So these are kind of uh, stable um, microdomains. And uh, interestingly, this is also what we observe in the model uh, that I presented briefly. So we see a stable hotspot areas of activation and some some of these hotspot areas uh, lead to wave expansion over the whole uh, astrocytic domain, and uh, some lead only to confined uh, activity. Yeah, concerning the model, I, I will kick in uh, with a question that uh, is going to merge with another question from Kristen Lank from Finland. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, Kristen is asking actually if. Uh, you're considering so what pathways are you considering for the IP3 signaling and uh, whether also you are including any sort of ion fluxes through transporters or other channels uh, besides of course uh, the IP3 receptors and uh, the machinery that you show so far yes so uh, thank you for the question basically um, the model is based on the uh, popular model by ULA. Uh, so the, the EPI3 receptor model is uh, actually, so it traces back to Lee and Wilson model. And yes, we do account for uh, sources through calcium, so sources through plasma membrane, including uh, exchangers, but the digitalization of this uh, sources uh, can be different for different tasks and uh, for, for instance in a subset of model we use uh, an additional model of the calcium influx through NCX or efflux through uh, sodium calcium uh, transporter. And one last so question. That, that, that's flexible in this respect. Okay. One last question by Amit Garwal at Heidelberg. Uh, one million dollar question actually what confines the calcium to a hot spot what is your what is your opinion about it? yeah indeed it is a million dollar question uh, because I don't know the answer um, it may be morphology uh, issues because in the model what we what we only have is morphology I mean what is uh, separates different regions so it can be uh, kind of diffu diffusion limits uh, uh, to, to, to the spreading. But that's, that's model. In the real life, there can be other, uh, other sources or other um, reasons for, the, for it to be con confined. For instance, uh, maybe tangles of mitochondria there. Mm. Mm. Can be different. In your so model? In your model, like uh, uh, your hot spots are the result of what exactly? Where do they come from? Uh, you know, in, in the model, uh, there is a uniform, approximately uniform probability of uh, small calcium transient uh, uh, and small uh, glutamate transient, which is uh, uh, supposed to be in uh, local 
synaptic activity. Uh, but then uh, it is linked to morphology, uh, how large is the input of the plasma membrane uh, uh, source of calcium to, to change in uh, intracellular uh, calcium level, and also uh, how fast it diffuses uh, from, uh, from this region. And this interplay of morphology and stochastic drive uh, leads to uh, formation of these uh, hotspots or initiation areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, take over. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, very nice talk. And I would like to thank also all the other speakers. Um, now we uh, will have like a few minutes break, and uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, add uh, some slides for the next session that uh, we will start within the next 25 minutes uh, with uh, uh, Leonid Savchenko from UCLL and Feng Xinkao from the University of Melbourne uh, sharing the session. Thank you, everyone, and I'll see you in uh, 20, 25 minutes. I think I'm yeah, going to start now, or I'm, I can start introducing. So welcome back to the very last, uh, yeah, the, the to the talk, uh, the very last talk before another break. And uh, this talk is given by Leonardo and Savachinki, uh, right? Yeah. Savachinki. Okay, <laughs> hope I pronounced uh, correctly. Uh, and uh, um, thank, uh, thanks, uh, Marzo, for uh, providing me a short, uh, short introduction of you. Sorry, it's uh, um, not Marius, yeah. but it's okay. Uh, we, can, no. we, can, we can work out on the pronunciation things here, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, so Leonid uh, is from uh, Ukraine and was trained in uh, Dnipropetrovsky uh, National University, is that right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And he has been a senior staff scientist at uh, University uh, College London and uh, worked with uh, Dmitry uh, Rosakov uh, in, yes. uh, in Dmitry's lab uh, since 2010. And his contributions to calcium modeling and signaling field has been multiple. He is a key modeler of the intro, uh, 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 intrasynaptic transient. And over the past 10 to 15 years, he has been uh, exploring his knowledge of uh, the molecular pathways of synaptic calcium and uh, exocytosis in astrocytes. In particular, he is the, uh, the the father of uh, Astro and uh, Arachni, I know this is a capital of this abbreviation of ASTRO and uh, A-R-A-C-H-N-E, uh, which are currently the two. Arachne. Uh, Arachne. Yes. Yeah, Arachne. Arachne. Yeah. It, it's, okay. it's a spider. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, which are currently the, 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 the to only platform for modeling and simulation of calcium transit in digital astro science with realistic morphology, and, and which has been constantly developed since the past three to four years as a uh, module extension of, um, of Neuron, which is another kind of package of software. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce you, and uh, um, it's your turn to. Okay, thank you very much. Can I share my screen? Uh, yes, yes. Looks like you're correct. Yeah. Good. Yes, yes. Look, looks okay. Looks good, yeah. Can I do something? Uh, you're screening. It's, it's okay, yeah? It's fine? Yeah, yes, yeah, fine, it's fine. Yeah, it's, 
Leonid, you can just uh, push the hide button on the on the button, so just uh, we can get rid of the bar on the button. Okay. Uh, just hide this, yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Great. Okay. Shall we start? Okay. Um, I want to thank the organizer first for this nice virtual meeting. It's my first experience of this kind of meeting, probably not only mine, but a lot of people. But I really hope to see you soon in the real world. I don't really like to live in matrix. And my talk today is about design and modeling platform Astra. It's like a new version. The Astra was introduced a couple of years ago, and we're supposed to, uh, to release Astra 3 in, during this summer, but because of these events, we're not able to release Astra 3. It's maybe postponed for the end of the summer or beginning of September. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to discuss not only uh, simulation in clouds, uh, but I'd like to, to discuss how to organize this simulation in cloud using hybrid componential approach, especially for cell simulation. Okay, astrocyte. Astrocyte is the most sophisticated cell, I think, in terms of geometrical sense, and having at least two levels. One level, it's microscopic level. It includes soma, and then dryads around. This is typical for neuron cell. But astrocytes also have, we can just spot nanoscopic level, or special microporosity sponge, which densely binds the macrocyte structure of uh, skeleton of the cell. And this is geometrical cell, is the reason why an astrocyte is extremely difficult to simulate. However, if you can, you cannot escape uh, the shape if you want to simulate following physiological processes of astrocyte. The calcium way. You cannot simulate calcium way. It's a beautiful, this experimental observation of calcium way without taking account the shape of astrocyte. You need just to put it in the power. Also, you cannot simulate the spontaneous calcium activity because sometimes you need to understand why it's appearing in some different area of astrocyte, why in this small area or the big area, why it's far, far away from soma, close to the soma. You need a real, a real self of astrocyte. Also, you cannot simulate potassium and sodium dynamic. This is critical for astrocyte physiological activity because it's it's clean extracellular space, it's keeping homeostatic extracellular space, and it, you, you need just to understand why it's keeping and what is the density of channels, what is the density around special place. Okay, challenge to stimulate astrocyte. What is the challenge? It's a first. Astrocyte is non-uniform complex shape cell. And um, Compared to neuron, astrocytes are uh, interested in long-term physiological processes. For example, neuron simulation, action potential, synaptic potential, even the trend of action potential, it skips second maximum, a couple of seconds. But astrocytes, you need just to keep interesting or simulation for minutes or sometimes hours. It's order of magnitudes longer than in neuron. And the distribution of channels in transporters of astrocytes, it's enormously non-uniform. In some areas around the sinus, you have a lot of double glutamate transporters. In other areas, just collect uh, potassium channels, like a uh, for one channels. And it means you cannot just create uniform distribution of channels, it just simplifies the model. And why? And this physiological astrocyte model is very complicated and therefore requires time-consuming computation. This is one of the problems. And to solve the problem of simulation of long-term ionic dynamics, including calcium, a complex shell being produced for astro platform is combination of local remote-polarly computation. This is Astro 3, 
we just introduce Astra 1, Astra 2, is Astra 3, which can work for at least for three platform, like Windows, Max, and Linux. Combine MATLAB Neuron in Python altogether, but with just more concentration for release version, it will be more concentration of MATLAB and everybody can just use a self-installing version. And you need just web for a remote computation. Why you just concentrate on MATLAB? It's much more easy to deal with uh, experimental data, to create installation version and so on. <clears throat> Neuron, we introduce. Uh, it's just combination with MATLAB and Neuron. We introduce Neuron because it's a huge database and you can use different mechanism. It's just one click, just simply add mod file to the installation version and you're ready to simulate. It, you need a couple of minutes to start new simulation with new mechanism. <coughs> and Python, it's for uh, mostly for web design, for remote computation. This is why we can combine these all the languages. There is three versions of Astra that can be downloaded from Neural Algebra. At the moment, this web page is under construction. This is ready for Astra 3. This is expected in the end of the summer 2020s. 20, uh, and each version has its own scenario of installation. Also, you can just find this version on GitHub. First version is a basic circle. You can find on GitHub, you can find Neuro Algebra. You just download, install, and just create some uh, platform or remote cluster. Or self-installing version, it's based on MATLAB self-installing version. And uh, it's freeware, everybody can just download. And even if you don't have a MATLAB, it doesn't matter. You can just very easy to start to installation and it automatically download free MATLAB from the MATLAB page and you're ready for simulation. But it will be located only on your computer and you just start working only on your personal computer, desktop computer. And the last version is self-installing version, but it can also install virtual machine on Amazon Cloud. It means when you just install in your computer, it automatically will install um, part of the version of Amazon Cloud. Okay, this is a simple organization. We just, to, to work with this complex cell, we just create very simple organization of uh, <coughs> simulation. Uh, you, have, you have desktop computer, and remote cluster, and they combine the advantages of desktop computer, like you just familiar with your computer and so on, and with remote cluster. It's faster computation. Any remote, big remote cluster, they use called elastic computation platform. It means as soon as you start working with a big model, it just extend all the power, just increase the number of computers you can use, and it's it just compute not one day or one year, but just a couple of minutes. This is hybrid computation in which is introduced here. And uh, you can create virtual uh, computer for your computation in three ways. You can use your local computer with pre-install MPI processing. It means when you install your Astra, it automatically will install like a virtual com computer in your computer and will just communicate there. It's really very useful sometimes when you just try to, to run many Astra variables uh, for on the same computers, okay? Uh, you can just install virtual machine on your, for example, university cluster, you just, create the account and create the virtual machine. The, the best way for, for what introduced is Astra, it's Docker technology. It means you can create Docker and just if your remote cluster has a Docker, Docker container, you just very easy, just move the, your Docker and that's all. You have virtual machine on your remote cluster. <coughs> and what we propose, it just automatically will propose during installation, it's Amazon Web Cloud. It will be very easy. Just log, log here, and you have the windows, create new instances. And just click here, you can another Windows, new Astra instances, 
just put name, what, what, what name of your virtual machine and automatically create uh, the virtual machine with all parameters, space, uh, operating uh, memory and uh, the IP, what is the most important IP address, because in this case you can just connect to your virtual machine and that's fine. Uh, you can start working. It's you need just a couple of minutes. But one of the problems here is all the all, uh, virtual machine. It's security virtual machine. Uh, you can um, two. You can create two type of virtual machine. First time, it's user full access to virtual machine. What does it mean? It means you can just create another computer with everything operation system you can just go there install new software work in there but what the problem with this virtual machine as soon as you finish your uh, simulation you need just to kill this virtual machine why because as soon as the computer running day and night in probably in one month the hacker can just find this virtual machine you can use for another uh, goals this is one of the problem we had experience of this because normally when you just use your computer, you just walk in, the switch on, or you, some people using the cluster, but you have a special sysadmin, but this virtual machine without any protection, just running and no can protect it. And another we propose virtual machine for Astra, it's uh, not, you just can access only Astra. It means they create a special CCH canal security channel and you just communicate only with file of parameters. It means you have not access to virtual machine uh, by self, but you can just send parameters, they compute something and send you back. It's uh, for sure, it's much uh, safe virtual machine, but the problem with this, you cannot full access. You cannot, for example, uh, you, 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 you won't just modify the, the server or modify this computation, but you cannot. You, you just receive the set of parameters. Okay, principle organization of Astra. You have like uh, uh, basic local computers. You can design everything you want or design of uh, model, nanoscale structure, 3D structure short-term computation it's any short-term computation you can just do with your local computers but if you want for example calcium dynamic 20 or one hour dynamic spontaneous calcium activity for sure you need just to send somewhere on the cloud it will be faster not day of computation a couple minutes of computation and you have a special uh, platform you can use your mobile phone and just control the computation on remote cluster and the local host if it's switch on okay any calculation on the remote cluster are essential only if you take advantage of the parallel algorithm the question remain how to design a parallel um, algorithm especially for such structure like a single cell and uh, we just use method proposed by Heinz from Neuron and you can find this in this paper and uh, this is very simple cell divided in the e equal uh, areas the number of pro processor you use then just compute sometimes then synchronize let's compute again again synchronize this is very easy to, uh, to create parallel computation for the one single cell, not the network. After the uh, finish the computation, you have just end of the computation and you get result. The beginner think that the more processor you have, the better. The more powerful uh, processor you have, the fastest computation. But this is not the case. This is really very important. You cannot just create thousands of uh, parallel processing for single cell because you have a time of synchronization. The more processor you have, the, the more time of synchronization you need. This is example how the rate of computation depending for three different of astrocyte. Very simple astrocyte, medium astrocyte, and very complex astrocyte. What does it mean simple and complex astrocyte? The number of structure. 
the, the number of segment of astrocyte. Here, for example, 1,000 of segment, here the 10,000, here the 50,000. And you see, for, for small astrocyte, you need just only one computer. This is fastest for one computer. If you have uh, the astrocyte uh, 10,000 segment, you, you probably need seven, eight, nine computers. But if you have very complex astrocyte, you probably need more with just a of 12 computers, but probably need more. What Astra proposed, Astra proposed at the first stage, uh, called scale test. You just, your special panel, uh, tick here the scale test, stand run, is the Astra immediately tell you the optimal number of computers you need, just computation 10. You just fit the 10 computers, and just for all the computations for this specific virtual machine, for this specific Astra site, you just use on the 10 machine. It will save your money and save your time. And as the first step of realistic cell simulation, especially Astra site, we need to define the basic shape of primary branches structure. Astra site has at least three options. First, it's uh, select reconstruct the stem cell from special uh, from from, uh, from already prepared for astrocyte. Uh, selection uh, uh, reconstruct the cell cell from the uh, reconstruct uh, reconstructed already with end foot, or the you can download from neuromorpho. And we really thank for our collaborators from Finland, Maria, Lina, Lena. I hope I correct. And they, for, they propose nice Python code for download from the neuromorpho to Astra. And when you just use this approach, you will get shape like this or shape like this. It's depending on the power of your computer. Okay. You just finish and just, just create a, a nice, beautiful cytoskeleton of astrocyte. Now you need to create nanoscale. I mean, you need just to put the sponge form around your cytoskeleton. And for this, you have a special tools built in, 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 in Astra to uh, digi digitalization of nanostructure from electronic microscope data set. You can just download uh, from electronic micros, uh, my, uh, microscope file. You have windows. You can just select different part of this. It's example show here. Yeah, Astra automatically transform for this uh, beautiful shape in coexistent cylinders because the Astra can work in the set of coexistent cylinders in the same way like a work neuron uh, models. It's much easier to incorporate mod files in all of this already done mechanism in, in the Astra. When you create this beautiful uh, shape, you need just to check. Is your created cylinders have the same properties to transmit information? I mean, just transmit a signal from uh, beginning to the end. And you have a special model just to simulate Monte Carlo. You put number of molecules here, put number of molecules here, just compute uh, diffusion or electrical current. And just compare, compare the um, current. This is diffusional flux. This is current. You compute in the same time. And you are just happy with this, uh, with this um, result. You can save this structure to your statistical data to generate nanoscale. OK. The complex geometrical structure of astrocyte need additional examination before long-term computation. Okay, you, you just decide to compute something like a calcium dynamics, something really very long, very, very complex. You need just extra check your, your geometrical parameters of your astrocyte. Okay, and you have just special panel here. Yeah, you just click it. From this astrocyte, the already generated from this cytoskeleton and nanostructure, just immediately compute what is the volume ratio, what is the volume, what is the surface, what is the distribution. If you really have with this result, you can just go next step. It's already done geometry. But if you're not happy, you have special panel, just tune a little bit, just modify geometry, then 
press and compute again and as soon as you're happy you go for the next stage okay and astra already has uh, some mechanism already embedded in this structure uh, now we this is just very preliminary now we add a lot of different mechanisms for glutamate diffusion uh, gaba diffusion gaba uptake, glutamate uptake, and uh, but you you can just test all of these parameters, so electrical properties, extracellular neurotransmitter dynamic, stimulate fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, calcium uh, dynamic, including calcium wave and spontaneous wave, and potassium and sodium diffusion uptake. But this is a little bit, for new version, you will have even more different uh, properties to, to simulate, okay? Any simulation of calcium dynamic, need just to start to check the electrical properties of cell. It means uh, depending on transmembrane voltage of cell, you will see the different calcium dynamic. You need just to keep this in mind that some people forget that it, when you astrocyte at minus 85 millivolt or 60 millivolt, it will be completely different calcium dynamic. Okay, and this is very, very important just to check what is the electrical property of astrocyte. You have a special panel for this. You can just quickly modify the membrane conducted at different um, uh, ionic uh, channels like a potassium, sodium ionic channels or liquid channels, any transporters here just to keep balance of these ions. You can just modify uh, conductance of the cell and at the end, you just can compute uh, input resistance and compare with your experimental result or you expect what is the kind of input resistance should be in this astrocyte. This is really very important start for the membrane electrical property of astrocyte before any simulation of ionic dynamic, okay? Astra can check the creation nanostructure uh, using uh, embedded mechanism fluorescence recovery after photo bleach. Why is it really important? Again, any diffusional property of astrocyte depend on the intracellular space, connection between different areas, and to check how in your simulated astrocyte, the model astrocyte, uh, uh, this is diffusional space inside the astrocyte. Before you start any diffusional modification, like any neurotransmitter, calcium or potassium, you can just start to test diffusional property of astrocyte using a fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. It, the astro has two, at least two embedded mechanisms. It's a line scan diffusion after uh, uh, um, fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching, a point uh, bleaching, depending on the distance. If you have at least one type of experimental data for a given astrocyte, you can just embed it your data and just check in the model, just fit in different diffusivity or buffer or something else, just fit your experimental data with, exper uh, with um, uh, simulation data. After that, you will be absolutely sure that um, your diffusive, diffusional property of your astrocyte, it looks like, okay, after that, you can start to simulate calcium dynamic. And this is a, this picture shows the dynamic of calcium dependent on fluorescence in astrocyte. The more we put spontaneous, uh, spontaneous activity, and which is sometimes you can just spot um, some calcium event here. And you now have a special panel for astrocyte. Um, we provide, astro provide special panel for analyzing intracellular calcium dynamic, including buffering, diffusion, waves, and different part and for this you have a space panel when you can just uh, see the dynamic of calcium in terms of concentration 
or you, you have just time panel. You just can locate this panel here and see the spontaneous calcium event. And you can see here th this, uh, this event in, uh, in microseconds. It means at least 50 seconds of real simulation, you need just to observe something. But sometimes you need not just one minute, but a couple of minutes or more time of simulation. Okay? And um, understand the mechanism. Um, hello. Yeah, sorry, we've got three minutes left. Okay. To understand hey. the mechanism. Yeah, yeah, I will just exactly finish in three minutes. Okay. Uh, to, uh, you can just simulate calcium wave. This is show the beautiful calcium wave. And for this, you have a special panel uh, in Astra just to simulate a calcium wave, which is propagated in, in real Astra side. You can see how the beautiful if you put this, it's real, you can see real how the calcium way spread across the astrocyte. This is profile way, or this is a snapshot from initial. This after five, seven seconds, how this spread the waves. Okay. You also uh, uh, model include uh, this no model. This uh, like a different model, but this platform include potassium calc uh, potassium dynamics or sodium dynamics. You can just play with extracellular concentration, local distributed, and see how it changes the voltage and intracellular concentration of ionic, for example, potassium in this example. Okay? And uh, here, just why Astra? It's because we use hybrid approach, combining desktop and remote computers with parallel algorithm. And you can start simulation, provide any complexity of faster side. You can just, sometimes you can just avoid nanoscale, use only micro scale. Uh, you can reproduce different uh, dynamic of uh, calcium and potassium. Uh, you can just create different architecture and very nice graphic interface for uh, untrained user. And I'd like to send the contributor and the tip from UCL and uh, uh, people from Germany and people from uh, uh, Milton Keynes in the UK. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you, Leonid, for the wonderful talk. And I think uh, we have uh, time for at most one, que one question. Okay. Uh, just check. Uh, Marizu, are you going to, can you see the Yes, questions? I do. So I guess you can't. Oh, okay. No. So I will. Uh, oh, yeah. Can you? So I, I say we have time for three questions. So then uh, the reminder of them can be addressed by Leone at the Neurostar platform. So it's going to be okay because um, we have to leave space for the question and answer session of the main meeting. Uh, Geoffrey Goodhill is going to answer the questions of his earlier talk today. So we have only few, a little time for three questions. Sorry, folks. Uh, Peng Shi, go ahead. Try to find which. Uh, so one question. So can you see the question? Um, I think I'm not. Uh, Leonid, can you see the question? Yeah. So, um, that's a question from Carlos. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat this. Is uh, Astro assuming one model and one set of parameter values for the whole Astro size? Different parts of Astro could require different parameter values in the model. Uh, is this possible to do in Astro? Uh, yeah. Uh, you see, it's it's. Uh, uh, it's Astra can, uh, you can just generate different distribution uh, in, in different space of different ionic channels or different, just very local, for example, you can just generate a local uh, transporter like a glutamate transporters or GABA transporters if you want to study, uh, for example, how the fast uh, uh, 
uh, AstraSight clean the extra sale space around the synapse. And for example, you can just put here a different concentration of iron or just local change in membrane potential and see how it works together, uh, just cleaning here. And, uh, and you see uh, at the same time, you can just record uh, voltage on the soma and see how it work, looks like experiment, for example, in different conditions. Yeah. Probably I answer, yeah. Yeah, there's a number of questions actually. Um, another simple question is uh, uh, by uh, Amit. Uh, it's, um, so, Leonard, a great talk. Uh, when can we do digital pharmacology on Astro? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, you see, uh, this. Uh, <laughs> We, we just think uh, just to introduce special panel uh, you can just play this different pharmacology uh, for this Astra but uh, it was working was to master students but during this lockdown it completely ruined our, our project but probably in the end of year we just introduce this new platform for for to to play with different uh, drugs uh, just blob for example different uh, type of uh, transporters or channels for example yeah this is just planning but you see uh, uh, yeah it's a little bit uh, mess with this current time Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we should finish this session now because the, the other uh, question on the session should have been started. Um, and thank you, Leonard, for the, for the wonderful talk. And uh, if you have any uh, uh, question, you can post it on uh, the New Stars. And thank you, thank you, everyone attending this session. And look forward to the next session uh, after uh, in a few few hours. Thank you. Thank you.